Point all. Yeah. Okay, I'll, I don't have this one in digital form, so we'll just go through it this way. This will be a good review of the previous stuff. What, what was that? I'm not sure. I'm going to go through this now. So here was the first one. What reagents do that? Um, you have to recognize that this is hydration of an alkene. And, whoops. Oh, this should be like this. Um, that was a typo on the thing. Hydration of an alkene. Um, however, it also needs to be uh, a hydration where there can't be a carbocation rearrangement, because otherwise it would rearrange to the this side of the funnel, right? Because that would be a benzyl. Right. So, yeah, nobody got that one, so that's a typo. Uh, sure. Okay. So it should have been like this, and the answer should have been hyd uh, hydration. But yeah, we, when when you see stuff like that, please ask. So we'll take the exam as a percentage out of eight instead. Yeah. <laughs> so that just means the other questions are just worth more than two each. So it might be good or bad. Right. So here you have hydration, and you have to use the mercury here because otherwise you would get some carbocation rearrangement. Okay. Um, next one then. Is um, Osmium tetroxide, which means what kind of reaction is going on here? Yeah, that's our syn dihydroxylation. It's a, it, sometimes it's not, it's not always important that it's syn. In this case, it is because it's in a ring. So there's definitely a difference between the cis product and the trans product. And because this is not perfectly symmetric here, we also have to make sure that we know that this is a racemic mixture. So you form both cis and antiomers. <clears throat> In the second one, you're not given the reactant, but you're shown that if we have uh, hydroboration, whoops, not BHF, um, followed by the oxidation. Form this product. So you have to pick the correct starting material. There's two possible alkenes that you can start with here. You can start with this one, you can start with this one. It's important that only this one um, start with, because the other one, if you start with if you start with this alkene, it's not selective. In other words, both sides are equally um, have equal steric environments, so we w wouldn't get a preference there, and we'd get a mixture of products. So that's the only one that will give us good selectivity. Oops. All right, the fourth one. What kind of a reaction is this? What kind of reaction is that? Yeah, this would be SN2 substitution. Right? You've got your leaving group and then uh, your nucleophile. Note that this is not ionic. This is like methanol, but with sulfur. Right? It's not ionic. It's not CH3 plus SH minus. So there should only be one product, and it should be this. Not ionic. It's not SH there because that wasn't an ionic thing. Um, I threw that in there mostly because this is how you're going to see reactions now on the next exam and on the final. It won't say, 
okay, here comes some substitution elimination reactions. Okay, here comes some alkene reactions. It's just, here's the stuff. What happens? You have to look at the substrate, figure out what kind of a starting material you have, what kind of a reagent you have, and then what kind of a reaction is likely because of all of that. And then we're also going to start piecing these things together a little bit more and looking at things like this. How do we get from there to there? There is no reaction, really, that, that simply makes a uh, bromine disappear and get replaced with it by a hydrogen. Right. We know hydride nucleophiles are not good nucleophiles. They're strong bases. So we can't we can't expect to have that kind of uh, we can't expect to have a one reagent that we just put in and we replace the bromine with hydrogen. And I gave you a clue there, saying you need two different reactions. You need two steps. So we have to think back and think, all right, well, where does this stuff come from? There's only really one reaction we know or that we've learned so far that can make uh, an alkane completely without any functional groups, just an alkane. And that's hydrogenation of an alkene. So whatever catalyst you like there is fine. We could actually pick any alkene. You could put that alkene anywhere you want. The reason I put it there is because that seems to be maybe a next step back toward what we have here. So if we use that for our hydrogenation, then we can look back and say, okay, how do I get from here to there? And what kind of a reaction is needed there? Yeah, that'd be an elimination reaction. So we'd pick an elimination with some kind of a smaller base, like sodium hydroxide or whatever. Um, hydride, yep, that would be a good one. So we might say elimination with sodium hydride followed by hydrogenation uh, for the alkene, or for the alkene. So the correct answer here would be to say, okay, first step one, sodium hydride. Step two, hydrogenation. And it's important to have that one and the two because you can't just throw all the stuff in together. You have to do it sequentially to get the different steps. Yeah? Just a question. You showed that like, uh, spherical graph with all the reactions. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Is it just the best thing to do is to do the problems and try to memorize that? Well, that's part of it. Um, I think it's also important to understand how those reactions work the way that we've kind of talked about them because of the regiochemical issues, the stereochemical issues, that kind of thing. Um, but yeah, I think certainly that should be a part of your, knowing that should be a part of your preparation for this exam, for sure. Um, yeah, I, I go back and forth here. There's, there's a couple issues. It, it's great to take a completely mechanistic approach to this chemistry. That is, you understand all the reactions and then you kind of think, find your way to the products every time. And you can usually get that to work, and that usually is OK. Um, but as, the, as we go on in the semester, and certainly next semester, you also need to kind of build a toolbox in your head of just reactions that you know. You know what they start with, you know what they do, and you know the reagents. Um, and there's not really any getting around that, that, that you don't have to memorize all that, but it's certainly going to make it a lot easier. And it's going to make um, your problem solving go a lot faster to just kind of have those. So I think that's important. Um, as well as, as kind of understanding or thinking about what's going on inside the reaction. All right. Okay, we have one more reaction from Chapter 9 to talk about, and then we'll be done. By the way, after today, we only have four more classes. We have two more chapters to do. This is going to be a little quick. Um, also means we can't just spend the classes next week preparing for the exam. So exam prep has to all be on your own. We'll be doing chapters 10 and 11 in class um, next week and the week after. And then we'll use some lab time to prepare for the final at the very end just to do some practice. But please, please, please keep working on this stuff. Um, I know it's the holidays, but you know it's a good excuse to get away from people. Just tell them you don't have to study. You have to go study. Um, maybe loan your new video game system out to somebody so it doesn't sit there and tempt you and just work on your chemistry. What? What? I can never do that. 
You couldn't? It would help you not play it. You could rent it out to somebody. All right, all right. So the last reaction we're going to talk about is, yeah. You could, you could like, lock it. Could you put it in a... Put it in a safe and like give the key to someone else for a week or two. Yeah. Yeah, there are other good technology things. What? Yeah, there's like some good um, flashcard type apps and stuff that you can get for your phone too. So when you're, you know, have a free second or something, you can quick review your chemistry. Yeah. 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 I mean, we use it for the drawing, but ChemDraw on the computer has a lot more um, stuff to it. It can give you names. It can give you simulated NMRs. It can uh, just do a whole bunch of different stuff. You can draw things in different ways. You can, I would have um, done that if you go and bought that brand new. What? Oh, yeah. For downloading ChemDraw. Right. I'm sure you're going to I'm sure they don't think it's not funny. All right, all right, all right. <laughs> we, should, we should talk about some chemistry. Okay, this reaction, um, people tend to like this reaction. It's fairly easy to see and to figure out the products of. So here's what we do. Cleavage. Oxidative, what does cleavage mean? Yeah. Breaking something. Right? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> So you split this down the middle. You cleave. To cleave means to split. Yes. Were you not aware of that? Is this a new word to you? Like with a... Yeah. Like a cleaver? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> okay. And it's oxidative, which means it's done in an oxygen-rich environment, which we'll talk about the, the reagents in a second. And you end up making uh, ketones and aldehydes. So if you kind of see what happened in that reaction, it's like you just took the double bond, broke it apart, and put an oxygen on each side. And that's oxidative cleavage. Now the reagents that do that are O3, which, anybody know what that's called? Not trioxide. Maybe? Ozone, All right. Yeah. Ozone. So another name for this reaction, ozonolysis, yeah. Olysis is a suffix that usually means, um, you know, just reacting with something like hydrolysis or something. So this is ozonolysis, reaction to ozone. Um, the first step is to, is to react this with ozone. Ozone is the same molecule we think of like the ozone layer. It absorbs UV rays, but it's also uh, a gas that you can just use as a reagent. It also is a problem when we have ozone at the ground level. It's, a, it's considered a pollutant. It causes uh, asthma and stuff like that. And then this is, the second step of this is an important um, part, and for a reason I'll tell you in a second. It uses something called DMS or dimethyl sulfide. Dimethyl sulfide is just two methyl groups connected by a sulfur, kind of like a, an ether, but with sulfur. And there's another second step you might see, zinc with acetic acid. Or actually, the book says just water. You'll see that a couple of ways. The reason those steps are important is after the ozonolysis, you have an unusual um, intermediate called an ozonolide. So if you just react with the O3, I'm not going to go through the whole mechanism, but I will show you what that looks like.
Yeah. yeah. That's kind of a weird thing. It's an ozonide. And then the next part breaks that apart into the, the ketone and the aldehyde. There's actually another way you can do that. If you use, um, this is called a reductive workup, meaning you work up the reaction or you kind of finish it, clean it up in the presence of a reducing agent. Dimethyl sulfide and zinc are both examples of reducing agents. If you do this in the presence of an oxidizing agent like peroxide instead, you actually make uh, carboxylic acids instead of aldehydes. So if you take this ozonal, ozonide and you work it up with something like hydrogen peroxide, instead of getting the ketone and the aldehyde, you still get the ketone because there's a carbon on both sides, but the other one actually becomes a carboxylic acid. <coughs> so let's practice that. You don't do anything else to the reaction. So there's already a hydrogen here. Just stays the same. See, the only thing that's changed here is that's broken apart, and there's an oxygen on each side. The hydrogen was there, still there. Yep, still connected to the same carbon. You can also do this inside a ring, so you can have. Um, oxidative cleavage of something like this. See if you can draw the product of that reaction. So, same thing. Don't be confused or fooled or whatever by the fact that it's inside a ring. Cut that thing in half and just draw it. And it'll look weird. We can make it look less weird after we're done. So let's just put the two oxygens on there. Yes. And so that's what it would do. You can first draw it looking weird like that, but if you actually want to draw this properly, like you want all the points on an exam question, you should not leave it in that form. You should stretch this thing out. So you kind of notice, okay, this is a 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6 carbons with aldehydes on both sides. So 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6. Okay, so those are the same thing. That's how we should express it finally. What? Um, this would be. Those are aldehydes. I believe it's called a dipic aldehyde. Because I believe so, because a dipic acid, I think, is six carbons with an acid on both sides. Do you just think all the words we're using today are funny? Yeah. Um, it's like somebody who like, thinks of a molecule, and they're like, well, no, I'm just going to call it this. Yeah. I don't know the history of that one, but yeah, it usually comes from some, like, the plant that they found it in, or whatever, what they used it for. All the old names have weird origins of different types. That's why we try to standardize it more now. OK, try one more. Change this a little, a little bit.
You can ozonalize multiple alkenes also. So in this molecule, actually, both of those would um, be cleaved. Let's see if we can draw the, that product. I have a question. Yeah. So you see the molecule, it's a little larger organic molecule. They have like a huge like, sheet of fashion that's very important to function. How would you synthesize that huge hydrocarbon reduction? Um, a, a lot of different ways. Because I know sometimes nowadays you almost have to Well, yeah, there's that. I mean, there's lots of different things. One thing we've seen, that we've seen so far, is hydrogenation. <clears throat> so you start with a molecule with lots and lots of functional groups everywhere, convert those functional groups to alkenes, and then hydrogenate them so that that whole part becomes just Hydrocarbon. That would it would like bridge the gaps between functional groups. Right. But you'd have to kind of start with stuff. The other thing is start with that. You know that 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 skeleton, that carbon skeleton may be something that already exists. You know, um, like like um, sometimes easily harvestable biological molecules are used as starting materials because they already have a certain scaffold that you want to build from. Um, just kind of depends what, what the price of the starting material is and how many steps it would require to actually make it. Okay, see if you can draw this. See if you can draw that product. Again, you're going to use the same strategy. You're going to split it up, whether or not it looks good, whatever, and then stretch it out so it looks proper. Yes. Yeah. So you're going to split both alkenes in this case. It seems especially dark today. It's okay. You can see the papers and stuff. It's just the way Okay. All right, so I'm just trying to kind of draw it in a way that is the same. But that's what would happen if you split that up, right? You just get an oxygen. I'm just, I haven't finished drawing the rest of it yet. And there's going to be one here. Like that. Sort of. You kind of see where, where I'm going with that? Okay. So now we have to stretch this out in a way that kind of makes more sense. And again, numbering your carbons is always the way to go. So we'll start up here. One, two, three, four, five. Six, seven, eight, and then there's a couple more down here. And this is not necessarily the proper numbering for the name. I'm just trying to kind of keep it straight. So it looks like we've got a chain of eight carbons and then a couple more coming off the end here. In fact, I'm going to call those A and B just so that we know they're not part of the actual regular chain. So that's one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight carbons. And then I've got A and B coming off carbon number five. See that? So there's A and B. Then I have an aldehyde on carbon one, a ketone on carbon six, an aldehyde on carbon eight, and B. So that's the correct product. And you could also draw the hydrogens off the uh, end of the aldehydes if you like. <clears throat> there are a few more problems like this in the book to practice. Ozonalysis is 
usually only used in these kinds of situations when you want to split up cyclic things because otherwise you have multiple products, which means you have to either purify stuff or throw something out or um, you just have a mixture of stuff. The only other time that's useful is when your byproduct is something really small that's easy to get rid of. So you have a big molecule um, like this. I don't, I don't know exactly. I'm just um, drawing some stuff. Let's say you have something like this. These things are aromatic. That, that's the term for that kind of benzene type structure. So they're not as reactive. They're not reactive to ozonolysis. You could then ozonolyze these. This stuff would stay the same, and you'd get the ketone. And your byproduct would be acetone, but this stuff would be a solid. So it would be easy to separate the acetone away from that. Um, I, I know, it's big. Yeah, you know, it's really big. It's uh, these these this part here is called naphthalene, and so naphthalene by itself is a solid. Um, so stuff attached to it's going to be even bigger, still solid. Anything with carbon and hydrogen above, um, like I don't know, nine or ten carbons or so, it's probably a solid. What if you just had like an aromatic ring and you had it with like wouldn't be reactive, no. No. Like even with heat, you couldn't do anything I'm not sure. I'm not sure what what would be involved there. Um, if there's some way to catalyze it, but it's pretty stable. It takes pretty severe conditions. I'm not sure the the ozone molecule itself is actually reactive enough to do it. Um, it might be, but I don't think so. I don't know. Look it up. Let me know. OK, so that's officially all the reactions in Chapter 9. Now we want to put them together a little bit and talk about probably the most important topic in the whole class, which is synthesis. There's going to be a whole chapter devoted to this, which is Chapter 12, which we might get to a little bit this semester, but probably not. Sin what? We'll definitely get 10 and 11. No, this is this is the end of chapter 9. They talk a little bit about synthesis, but chapter 12 does it in greater detail. Um, synthesis, of course, is building molecules, putting things together, making them. And that's really the whole point of everything that we're doing here. How do we build these molecules together and make the things that we want. Now we know enough reactions that we can actually do this. So we can start making some plans to make the kind of uh, things that we want to make. In some cases, that's pretty straightforward, like on our exam today. Oops. So these are all going to be problems now of this type, where we say, what do we put in here? What do we use to do this reaction, to make this thing from this other thing? In this case, we want to make this alkyl bromide from the alkene. So we go back to our toolbox of reactions, and we say, well, all right. First question is, do I know any reactions that just do that in one step? Second question is, if not, then how can I plan for that? In this case, do we know anything that does that in one step? Yeah, what? That's not a thing. Try that. This is addition of HPR, but can we just use HPR here? No, it's the uh, Right. It's the opposite selectivity. So we need. 
Yeah, peroxide. So we can pick up. We can just say R O R, but we, better we could actually pick a peroxide. So let's take. Uh, let's take the phenyl one, which is benzoyl peroxide. Doesn't really matter what you put there, methyl groups, whatever. You just need something with those two oxygens. That's why we say R O O R. Do that reaction. You do it, okay? So that's the simplest type of synthesis problem. It's just one step. What do we need to make this step into this? Sometimes it's multiple steps, but maybe we just know that reaction. Like, what if I said? This. Is that one that we know? Sodium hydroxide. Sodium hydroxide doesn't, doesn't react with alkenes. But it's a type of hydration. What type of hydration? Is it which type of selectivity do we want? Do we want the um, Markovnikov selectivity or anti Markovnikov? Anti. So, what what kind of reaction do we need to use for that? So it's in there. It's part of the reaction. All right. I'll just tell you. This is going to be the hydroboration oxidation. You're right. You're right. You, between the two, you got one step at the peroxide and the sodium hydroxide. Yeah. Okay, so now. <clears throat> so let's change this up a little bit. All right, same starting material. But now, instead of making these two, I want to make this one. You're just going to watch this? Yeah. I'm going to make my family watch it. Okay. I hope they learned something. I'm in class. Remember this. <laughs> Hi, everyone's family. Welcome to chemistry. <laughs> who will be having holding class at 1 p.m. on Thursday? Enjoy your turkey. Maybe I should be eating turkey also while I'm doing this. <laughs> yes. <laughs> All right. So what do you think? What's the difference here? There's a whole big group attached to it yeah. now. There's a whole big thing there. And do we know a reaction that just put that whole big thing on? Nope. No. But I guarantee you, if I ask a question like this on the exam, someone's going to put in there just that. They're going to write this. This is not the case. Or they might write this. Still doesn't work. We don't know that reaction. If you don't know the reaction, it's not going to work, right? We don't, don't guess that. Right, so now we have to do something else. Now we have to start making a synthetic plan. Nope, sorry. So we can't just make this in one step. We have to start thinking about what, how are we going to build this from other things, from intermediates. And the number one thing that I can recommend that you do in these kinds of situations, so I'll write it. Work backward. Okay? Work backward. This will. It will let me show you what I mean by that. So instead of saying, all right, I don't know what this can, well, how we can do this. This is not a one step thing. We can't do this. So what can we make this from that might be helpful here? And it doesn't have to be right. There's a lot of trial and error here. We just need to find something. There's also a lot of different right answers. Can you add H2S from oh, starting? starting from the wrong side. And that's, we'll talk about that, but that's usually, it's kind of like doing a maze. You guys ever do those? It's like a thing where they have a picture and you have to find your way through the picture. Is that a 
You know what I'm talking about? Yes. Okay. If you start from the beginning, there's always a bunch of dead ends that you run into and weird things that you go, because that's how they design it. If you go from the end, it's usually there's just kind of one way that gets back there, and it doesn't get you into the dead ends. So same way here. There are, if we think about what we can react this with to go forward, there's a whole giant you know, picture of possibilities. And I'm talking about that big circle of all that stuff. And we don't know which one's going to get us closer or not. So it's a lot of dead ends. But if we work backward, we avoid that. And we only will find something that actually works backward eventually. So what sort of thing might we make this from that, that is a little bit simpler? If I'm thinking about this, what I might think is, OK, well, this big thing, that's kind of a good nucleophile, right? We've seen things like that before, and they're good nucleophiles. So I'm thinking maybe um, like an SN2 reaction, where we use something like that as a nucleophile. That would work, right? I mean, we know we've seen SN2 reactions that do that kind of thing before. So what would, what would my substrate have to look like for the substitution reaction with this to look like this? Like what, what else would go here to react with this to form this? Well, it would be kind of the rest of this thing, right? So if this side is coming from my nucleophile, then this side must be coming from the substrate. And what has to be on there for the SN2 reaction to work? You guys got to review your substitution. SN2 here, we need a leaving group, right? So maybe something like that? OK. I mean, would this reaction work? Is that what I, This is what I'm saying. If, if I wanted this as a nucleophile, and that was my substrate, would that actually form that? Uh, yeah. Yeah. Right. So we've got this. That would attack here. Leaving group would leave. We end up with that product. Okay. So then the next question is, have we gotten any closer? Yeah. Does this help us? How does it help us? Yeah, we actually just did this, right? This is now this. So we just made, we just um, found this, which we know we can get to in one step using those same conditions. With whatever kind of peroxide you like. So we've solved the problem. That's how you would solve the problem. It's a two-step synthesis, and we found a way to work backward and find these intermediates. Now, all of this, these problems are great, and there will be lots of them on the exam, but this is all um, dependent on you knowing all those reactions, that when you see this, you say, oh, yeah, that's something I can make from the alkene. So that's going to take a little work, um, a little work to get down on. OK. Is there a limit to the number of steps that not really, but at some point it becomes. Um, un no, it, it becomes easier. Like I could make some huge thing, right? But if I don't put limits on like the number of carbons on your starting material, then it's still just like a one-step reaction. So that's more what I'll do. I'll give you big molecules, but I won't put limits on the number of uh, carbons. <laughs> you can just use big things for your nucleophiles. Uh, no, those are all ones you got to know. Yeah. All the ones we've talked about so far. And next semester, there will be those and a whole lot more. So, yeah. <coughs> Sorry. That's, that's part of the curriculum. OK, let's try some other stuff. Now, one way that I know that seems really tough, and this seems tricky, and it is. But what you'll find is when you start doing lots and lots of these, is the same things keep coming up. 
And the same types of things keep coming up over and over again. And the book actually does a really nice job of going through some of these and talking about um, these different ones. So like one of them, I'll show you what I mean. Let's look at this problem. Now, is this something that we can do in one step? No. no. There's no reaction that just takes a double bond and puts a, car, a hydrogen on there and then moves it over to somewhere else. That's not something we've talked about at all. So it's going to take a couple steps. And when you first look at this, it's going to seem a bit daunting because, I mean, how do you even go about this? How are you going to move a double bond around? But I'm going to show you, and then after this, every time you see a double bond moving around, you can use the same strategy. And it's always the, kind of the same thing. So working backward, what kind of things do we get double bonds from? If I want to say, like, ignore this for a minute, but I just want to say, all right, what do we make double bonds from? Elimination, right. So what would a substrate look like that would eliminate to form that double bond? Yeah. Sure, something with a BR attached to it, like this. And what kind of a reagent would I need to do that elimination? A strong base that's also... Yep, that's also... Big, right, because there are, multiple, there are two different possible elimination products. So I have to make sure I'm getting this one and not this one, right? So that's addition. That's different. No, we want the um, the elimination that gets to the less substituted carbon. So, you know, yeah, we use a big base, one of those big nitrogen bases, or maybe potassium terbutoxide, right? We've talked about this stuff. So yeah, great. That's how we make alkenes. Good. Does that get us any closer? So now we look back again. Can we make this from this or something like it? Yeah, yeah how do we do that? Right. So that's it. So now we've, uh, we, we've solved the problem. We've done an addition reaction followed by an elimination that has changed the position of the, of the alkene. And addition followed by elimination is really the key to moving the double bond around. So addition, then elimination. Addition gets you the, the leaving group on there, and then you eliminate to get rid of it. So these are some, some different ideas here. So on that reaction arrow, would you just Right, like one and then two and then the reagents. Yeah. So here I might write I think it's always helpful to work it out step by step, um, and then rather than just trying to think about it in your head and then writing it down um, numerically. But that's how you would you'd write it at the end. Okay, what about HBR adds BR on one side of the double bond and H on the other, and then you eliminate it. Right, right. Okay, another example. Right. That's next chapter. We've got a whole chapter coming up. Yep. All right, what did I want to, okay.
Is that going to be a one-step reaction? No. Yeah. But we can figure this out. Now, moving forward, going forward, like starting from the beginning, that's not going to be helpful because there's so many things that we could react that first one with. But looking at the product and moving backwards, we should be able to figure it out. What do you think this is the product of? Yeah, oxidative cleavage of some kind of a ring with a double bond. So that would be, we have to make sure we have the right ring here. So let's number our carbons. We know we're going to connect these two. That's a six-membered ring. And we know we need... Yeah, we know we need an extra carbon coming off, carbon number one. So let's do that. Okay, so that means that's the kind of alkene that we want. All right, are we any closer? <coughs> Does, do we, can we form that alkene from the starting material? Yeah. We can. I mean, I drew it kind of flipped over, but if we... That's the same thing. So that, should we, we should be able to make that from there. How will we do that? And, and what kind of a reagent for the elimination? We usually want to avoid E1 reactions. But in this case, actually, it would be fine. This one we want a small base to make sure we have the correct. How about sodium hydride is a little better. Sodium hydroxide can be a nucleophile, so we get a little better selectivity for elimination if we use the hydride instead. Hmm? And deprotonates, right? Yeah, because it's H minus. Hydride. It's a strong base. Sodium plus H minus ionic. So we take one of those C, uh, put it in C H, take away the H. Right. Okay. Let's try another one. Yeah, I mean, we can, in the next chapter, actually, with alkynes, we can start doing that. So we will. Okay, um, how about this? No, wait. Okay, same thing. See if you can figure this one out. Not exactly. I mean, a peroxy acid. But right, well, that's the first clue. Remember, the first thing you're always going to ask yourself after you've determined that you can't do this in one step <clears throat> is to say, what do I make this product from? And I make this product from an alkene. using 
a peroxy acid like peroxyacetic acid or metachloroperoxybenzoic acid, whichever one you like. And once you've found that, now we can say, all right, this is formed via elimination. And this one we can we can use sodium hydride, we can use whatever we want because it doesn't really matter. There isn't a competing Hoffman elimination. Okay, this one's going to take a couple minutes, so take about five minutes and see if you can come up with a plan for this one. Same kind of strategies we've been talking about. Remember, start from the end. Think, where does this come from? What can I make this from? And work step by step back. For now, you might, if you have a picture of that, um, of all of the reactions, that might be something to have next to you just to think about. Yeah. Is it a hint or is this going okay? Looks like I'll be really burning. Is it high? Yes, I think it's going to be a hint. Like for the first thing, yeah. I, I think like you should get like a PR where the whole bond is. Mm -hmm. like, 
Let's let's talk about it. So I think you got it. You got it mostly right. You see this, and see that this is a is an elimination product of something like that, right? So you're going to eliminate with a large base. We just talked about that. Then you notice that this is a product of addition, and addition of the alkene that get also gets you close to where this OH was. So then the next step is, okay, can I eliminate the alcohol to form this? Now, what kind of a reaction is it when we eliminate an alcohol and a hydrogen on the other side? It's a special type of elimination. It has its own name. I mean, it's the same thing, but it has its own name. We just did it in class last week. No. 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 That's the other way. That's adding water to the alkene. Now we're talking about eliminating it away. So what do we call it? That's adding hydrogen. What do you call it when you get rid of water? Because we're getting rid of OH and H. No, that's adding water. Dehydration. How do we do dehydration? Right. So we're going to use concentrated acid and heat it up, just like we did in lab. And that's how you would do this. We can't use a strong base here because a strong base would just deprotonate the alcohol. So if you want to use a strong base, you have to convert that alcohol into a leaving group first through, through a tosylate or something, like here. So if you wanted to use a strong base or you couldn't do dehydration for some reason because you wanted the opposite selectivity, redress selectivity, then right, you'd, use a t you'd make a tosylate so that make your OH into a better leaving group and eliminate that way. So that would work too, right? That would work too, yep. So I was kind of all right then. Well, except the base you chose is a big bulky base, which would give you the other oh. alkene, give you the wrong alkene. So. All right, so please uh, work on this stuff. We're going to add some more reactions to it on Tuesday when we talk about alkynes. So we're going to go through um, more stuff. What? No, we're just going to do the lab, the, de the uh, hydration of norbornene lab. And then we'll turn in uh, notebooks today, too. All right, so we'll head up and uh, start when we can. I'm stressing you out? I'm sorry, I don't know what to say about that. I'm not, I'm not really that sorry. Yeah, that's, a, that's not the right thing to say. Um, a couple, couple things to do here. You definitely want to uh, remember the reaction conditions and the mechanisms that we talked about. No, I found a chart online. Not like here, it's a little different. It just has like what yeah, reactants, like what, like the yeah. elimination should like. Products, yeah. and, then um, and then just work through the problems, yeah, and, and see if you can do, start doing the problems without looking at one of those charts. So, like, if I want to do more problems for the exam, I can decision, like, copy another workbook for you to do? Yeah, send me an email um, over break or just come see me next week and I'll get you more. There's also, you can always look up stuff too. There's a lot. This particular chapter lends itself well. So just like question, repetitious. Now, if we get through this and we want to start doing some assist, do we, can we do chapter tw the 12 ones? Or those Not quite, because those, those involve reactions in chapter 10 and 11. All right, all right.
<laughs> you can try, and some of them will make sense. It'll be a good head start on chapters 10 and 11. Do you suggest reading the book, or do you suggest um, I was going to read the book, just... Reading part of the book, you know, watching the video, looking at the notes, that kind cover, of stuff. Do you cover the basic concepts? Yeah. Yes. Because, like, the book goes a little bit further. So yeah. You cover, like, the important stuff. Yeah. yeah. So and in this chapter, honestly, I stuck I pretty like, close to the book. I don't mean just that chapter. I meant just, like... Other stuff? I meant, like, chapters 8 through 7 together. Yeah. I think um, we don't vary a whole lot. For so these chapters, this, this book doesn't. This book doesn't have too much extra stuff. So, so either way, whatever works better for you. Yeah, and really see, and then go back. Like use the book more like a reference book. Like you've gone through the stuff, you thought about it. Now you're trying to do the problem, but you're stuck. So then just find that spot in the book that unsticks you, rather than like reading through sentence by sentence for the whole chapter. I'm just a little bit behind, it's stressing me out.